My name is Jeremy Walton, and this is the Cinematography of Ferrari. Let's go. If you want to know how they created the look, the lighting, what cameras and lenses were used, and the approach the filmmakers took to pull all this together, then stick around as I cover the 2023 film Ferrari, directed by Michael Mann and cinematography by Eric Messerschmidt. By the way, I know I've covered Eric Messerschmidt a lot lately. That wasn't intentional. Michael Mann is one of my favorite directors, and he obviously wanted to work with someone that's been killing it. With top filmmakers and a $100 million budget, I'm always curious what cameras they'll go with. If we go to IMDb and under technical details, for camera, we see they use the Sony Venice 2. They don't always list everything on there, but I'll get to that. Here's the Venice 2, and Michael Mann has been shooting a mix of digital and film for a long time. I remember seeing Collateral in theaters years ago, and a portion of that film was shot on the Viper. As for Messerschmitt, when asked about the film versus digital debate, I'm not afraid of pushing things around. These cameras are all designed around replicating human vision, and they do that extraordinarily well. It's very easy to get an image that is exemplary of human vision with a digital camera these days. Ferrari was one of the first movies to shoot with the Rialto 2 extension system that enables you to detach the sensor from the camera body for a more compact size. If this sounds familiar, I covered the Rialto system for Top Gun Maverick, which they worked with incredibly tight spaces. The filmmakers wanted to try something new for Ferrari. You know, we've seen a lot of race car driving in movies, but what was the goal for Ferrari? He wanted to put the audience in the car seat. You know, he wanted you to feel like you smelled gasoline while you were watching the movie. They put this camera all over the car from the bumper to the hood and even handheld shots from the passenger seat to give energy to the shots. Man described using 30 to 40 different configurations to get the shots he wanted from the cars. That particular system freed us up enormously and it allowed us to be quite expressive with the camera in a way that I don't think normally would be possible, certainly not at that quality. If you combine this camera work with the actual speeds the cars were driving, which were over 100 miles per hour, you get something, well, something I would love to do at that level. On my car, going 40 is a bit different. I did notice an interesting movement to the camera that's different than your typical locked off camera mounted car shot. This had a unique feeling that I liked, but knew something was going on. And then we devised a system like Rails where I could have a camera moving on a car, not just a stationary mount. So it could slide up from the right front fender, up the side of the car, come up the passenger side, pan left, and see the car next door. When it comes to the driving scenes, these were some of my favorite shots. Anything to do with fast moving cars and strapping cameras to them? is a win for me. These cars are visceral, they are loud, and the engines shake, and the suspension is stiff. That was something we wanted to show from the very beginning. The Sony camera also provided internal NDs, and since they were using multiple cameras simultaneously, Messerschmitt was able to leave his iris alone and not slow down filming with filtration changes. These are the little details that matter. The other camera that was used was a red Komodo. Here's some photos that were posted not too long ago that show the setup that was used, and Messerschmitt talked about the small size of the Komodo, which helped with the weight distribution and aerodynamics. I wasn't able to really find information that described the difference between using the Sony and RED camera. Were they using it for specific shots or different car setups? The Rialto 2 also has a small footprint, so it would be nice to know what factors were involved in these choices. When talking about different cameras, I do want to mention Messerschmitt used the DXL2 for Devotion, the Red V Raptor for The Killer, and now the Sony Venice 2 for Ferrari. We have different directors and their style does come through, but so does Messerschmitt's. I say that because we do talk about cameras and lenses a lot. I love that stuff, but it's not always the determining factor for the look of a film. All that stuff contributes ultimately to the way the movie looks. I have day-to-day -day responsibilities on the set, lighting choices, lens choices. To me, it's a much bigger conversation than, you know, just where I put the lights. That's the simple stuff. I will expand on that, but let me cover the lenses that were used. After consulting with Dan Sasaki from Panavision, this is what they went with. We took a set of lenses that had been designed for me for the film Devotion and we modified them slightly. So there's a little bit of spherical aberration in the lens that adds some softness in the highlights and cuts the contrast slightly. The look also consisted of a series of LUTs combined with filtration and color management, ultimately gave them the look they were after because it all has to work together. As Messerschmitt reveals, you can't leave all the heavy lifting up to the lens. 
Here's something else Messerschmitt said about his lens choices. I love modern lenses because I like them to be consistent. I'm not someone who is necessarily attracted to the idea of vintage lenses. It is hard when you change lenses and it requires a different f-stop or one lens exhibits a pink hue and the next is green. Even though you can fix it, it drives me nuts. When it came to racing, a lot of longer lenses were used to compress the space during the racing scenes and outside of the cars they went wider to get closer to the actors to create a different aesthetic. This contrast between the racing and intimate scenes went even further so let's get into that. I think that the movie is very much about contrast. You know, it's about these sort of polar forces in opposition in his life. We wanted the movie to have the visuals of that film to really distinctly differentiate those two places. When you see the film, you'll be able to tell the differences between the two environments. The racing is pretty obvious, but the scenes with Adam Driver and Penelope Cruz were lit and shot very differently. Michael Mann put an emphasis on certain paintings and that's what they ran with. I put together a lookbook and sent back images. Tintoretto, Titian, and Caravaggio, of course. And a little bit of Rembrandt, too. That style of classic Italian portraiture with a mix of the Dutch masters in there as well. And that was really the direction we wanted to go with the personal story. I've talked about it time and time again, but this is the stuff during pre-production that most of the filmmakers I've covered do. Paintings are used as references, testing of cameras and lenses. It's a visual language that you'll hear time and time again if you listen. What they called the dramatic scenes with the actors were shot in a more structured or classically composed frame with little movement or what they refer to as patient. A classic Michael Mann shot is the use of the close-up. For this, they use the skater scope, which extends the lens to give you more of a macro and close focus look. We put it on Steadicam occasionally and it meant you could put the lens to someone's eyeball, but the operator is at arm's length away. We could fly it around Adam Driver or get the lens right behind someone's ear or into someone's face. It's a very unique, specific look. These shots aren't used very often, but when you see them, especially on the big screen, they have weight, they have impact. Go watch other Michael Mann films and you will see something similar. I think these shots are very well done. A lot of what they did was left up to the actors because the sets were lit to have them move freely in and out of the light, which resembled the paintings they were using as reference. I think it's incredibly disrespectful to the actors to say, okay, you're standing here and you're standing here and you're going to have the conversation and we're going to shoot it in these six shots. The film was shot in 58 days with no second unit and they shot in Italy in real locations. And when I say real, I mean historically accurate ones like Enzo's actual house and barbershop. This is what they called a modern period piece. You put people in real locations then the period stuff is done for you. After recently talking about Ridley Scott, I wanted to mention the work ethic of Michael Mann as well. You can probably see some similarities. He's incredibly focused. You know, he's up at four in the morning at the gym and he's making shot lists and thinking how he's going to structure his day and shoot till eight or 9 p.m. and he's back at it the next day. He works incredibly hard. I could cover a lot more the performance of Adam Driver and especially Penelope Cruz were incredible. Cruz had a fire lit in her, the intensity in her look, it's no surprise people are saying she stole the show. There's more info online about the execution of building the race cars, more interviews, some talk about the limited visual effects, so if you're interested, go have a look. If you're into filmmaking, I think this is worth a watch. It was independently financed, so it's nice to see a movie like this getting made. For Michael Mann, this film was 30 years in the making, but gave a shout out to the Netflix documentary, Drive to Survive. Due to its popularity growing over the last five years, when it came to make a movie about racing, this became the time to do it. Well, there you have it, the cinematography of Ferrari. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hit that like button because there's definitely more on the way. Subscribe so you don't miss out. Leave a comment if you have questions. Until next time, it's a wrap.